Okay, it's time for our memory verse. I hope everybody's ready. I know this is good for me because it helps me remember verses. Open your Bibles so you can read it out of the Bible. We're going to be reading Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10. Ready? Go. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasures. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. Our scripture reading for today, I want you to get your Bibles out. Everybody, I know you're at home, and I know it's, it's hard for you to get into the church mode here, but you've got to do it. So get your Bibles out. I can't see you, but I'm just going to ask the Lord to get after you. If you don't have your Bibles, get your Bibles out and open them, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. As I read, you follow along. And you know, if you're at home by yourself, just go ahead and read aloud with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to the visions, I will come to visions and revelations in the Lord of the Lord's Sorry, Here we go again. I'll read that one more time. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, whether in body, in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such as such an one caught up in the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in a body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which is, he seeth me to be, 
or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, though the abundance of the revelations that there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostle. Though I be nothing, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein ye were in inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome, burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you, for the children ought not to lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, and the less I, and the less I be loved. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, thank ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. Lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be, that I should be well many which, which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Good morning, and praise the Lord for this wonderful day, the, as we remember the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ and what that means to us, what he did for us on the cross at Calvary, and how important the resurrection is. And this morning's message is called to believe in the resurrection of Christ. And our text is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Once again, I want to encourage you that if, uh, if I'm going too fast, a lot of the passages will be up on the screen. Uh, you can also use your video controls to uh, stop and go back and uh, re-listen if you need to. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 says this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
Father, I'd like to come to you now and say thank you so much for this opportunity that we have. We're grateful for the, um, the media, and we're able to record these, and some churches live stream them to be able to reach the brethren and to continue to minister, but not only them, but also to our family and our loved ones and friends and, and so forth. And I ask now that you would guide the things that are said, and I pray that our hearts be ready to hear the things that you have for us. And I'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice in our text, if you will, it says this, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if we believe. Many of us have come to that understanding that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so this text is God's words of comfort concerning the future. It talks about those who are, uh, that we're not to sorrow for those that went on before us that have died but that the day is coming when the Lord is going to come and resurrect their bodies, and then there will be a time when there are some who are living will also be caught up to be with the Lord. But that's not really the point of the message. The point of the message is if you believe that Jesus died and rose again. You see, its promise centers on the great work of Christ in the gospel. We who believe in Christ believe in this promise in our text is yet to come. But you know, this belief had a beginning. For every soul, for every Christian, this belief had a beginning. Just as physical life has a beginning, so too does the spiritual life. And it begins when one understands their present condition before the Lord. And we gain that understanding through Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ reveals our need for eternal forgiveness. That is, it also reveals God's great work of mercy in our life. You see, the gospel is God's crowning work of God's mercy toward his people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to quote it in part and it's on the screen there defines what the gospel is. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. And then verse 3, How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You see, the call of God is to receive this gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that receiving is believing in his gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, and uh, one that we find great comfort, one that we who are Christians, uh, as God encouraged us and reached us with, his, with the gospel of his son, and so that verse is probably one of the most well-loved and most quoted verses of all. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God didn't want to offer any confusion. There aren't many ways to heaven. If there were, how would we know? There's only one way to heaven. And Jesus made that clear in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It was very clearly stated by the Lord that there was only one way to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life, and that was through him. And that's by God's mercy too. Otherwise, it would be all subjective. We would, we've already tried to create our own gods, and we already try to create our own religions, and all that does is confuse us. But God made it very clear through the gospel of Jesus Christ that he is the only way to heaven. And there's a reason for that. Because Jesus Christ is the only one that died for our sins. There's a call of God, therefore, to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To believe in the resurrection of Christ is to believe in the work of Christ. That is, in the death of Christ. That was his great work. In Romans 5, 6, it says, 
For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So there's a time in our lives because we just don't have the strength, and I'll get to that in just a minute, albeit briefly. But we didn't have the strength to save ourselves. We didn't have the strength to stand before God in a righteous way because we've sinned. It is those who do not keep God's law that are condemned, that are considered ungodly. Now on the screen right now are the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to quote them for you, but you can read them. You can pause if you'd like. But the Ten Commandments really are, uh, are the laws that we have broken. Those who have broken those laws are those who are the ungodly. Romans 3.10 says this, I mean, excuse me, Galatians 3.10 says this, For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So there's a curse for those who do not keep God's law all the time without fail. And so Christ came in due time to die for the ungodly. For the Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. To transgress means to violate God's law. And there's not one of us who have not lied who have, uh, or have not stolen or who have not committed adultery, uh, who have dishonored our parents. I mean, the list can just go on and on and on. There is not one of us who have not broken God's law, not just once, but over and over and over again. And yet the scripture says this, Galatians 3.10, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written, in the book of the law to do them. Breaking God's law, God tells us, has eternal consequences. In other words, there's an eternal penalty. In Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. Now, we exercise those things in our culture and really in every culture. When you break the law, there's a penalty for it. And the penalty's severity depends on the uh, type of, of crime that was committed. And God tells us that it's no difference. Matter of fact, that's where man got it from. And that is the breaking of God's law. There's a penalty. And that penalty is death. We're not talking about physical death, although everyone dies. We're talking about spiritual death. God will judge every man according to his works. And those works are infiltrated with sin. And those are the things that God will hold man accountable for. For, for Hebrews 9.27 says this, For it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So man won't be judged for the right things that he does. He'll be judged for the wrong things that he does. That sin in, in his life. We don't go to court and, and plead with a judge to uh, say, and when we're accused of wrongdoing, we say, but listen, I've done everything else right. I mean, I've been to work on time, I've paid my bills, et cetera, et cetera. Those are commendable things. And perhaps they might cause one to judge a little lighter, but it doesn't nullify and it doesn't justify wrongdoing. And God is, is certainly no different because he is holy. God's mercy, however, made a way of escape, a way to escape this judgment. You know, I was thinking about why would God go through such extremes, and, and just from my point of view, it's such extremes to send his own son to die for us on the cross at Calvary. Well, that's because God's the creator of man. God created man. And though it's just my opinion, just like I have a responsibility to my children, so God took responsibility in a way. <laughs> God's not responsible for sin, mind you. But he just took responsibility to, to us, and, and because of his love for us, just like any father loves their children, he did something about it. That's called God's mercy. And it made a way of escape this eternal judgment. Galatians 3.13 says, 
Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You see, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He went to the cross at Calvary, and the Bible says that he became sin for us. Who knew no sin? He was that perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ died on the cross according to the scriptures. To believe in the resurrection of Christ is to believe in the work of Christ, that is, in the death of Christ, and in the resurrection of Christ. Romans 4.25 says this, who, speaking of Christ, was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You see, he rose from the dead that we might be justified from all things, not just from some, some sins, but from all sins, all things. That's the power of Christ's resurrection. Had he not rose, we would never know if God would save us. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, here it is, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. You see, the power of God to forgive our sins was demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves God's power to save us because he was victorious over death. No man has been able to rise from the dead on his own. No man has the power to rise from the dead. But God did, and God demonstrated that power when he rose Jesus Christ from the dead. When we believe the gospel, we are trusting in his power to forgive us our sins through what Christ did for us on the cross at Calvary and to give us eternal life. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Bible calls it a lively hope. It's not a hope where we think it might happen. It's a, a hope that it gives us that absolute assurance, that which we hold on to the rest of our life. Not wondering, but knowing that Jesus Christ paid the price for us on the cross at Calvary. Christ rose again according to the scriptures. To believe in the resurrection of Christ is to believe in the work of Christ indeed and to believe in the person of Christ. That is, he is the Savior. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, this was and is the purpose of the gospel, and that is to save sinners. And since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that there are none righteous, no, not one, we know that Christ's uh, purpose when he came to this earth was to die for sinners and to save them from judgment to come. From his birth, even from his birth, he was recognized as the savior of mankind. At Christmas time, we, we, uh, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, many of us do. Even the secular world, uh, in one form or another, uh, recognizes that this is a, a time when Christians remember that their Savior, Jesus Christ, came. And one of the verses that is often quoted, uh, really throughout the world during that time, notice what it says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ our Lord. Right from his very birth, man recognized uh, that Jesus Christ, that little baby in the manger, was born to be a Savior, that he would die for our sins according to the scripture and was buried, and that he would 
rise again according to the scripture. The greatest passage of scripture is great because of this truth of Christ being the Savior. John 3, 16 and 17 this time says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. To believe in the resurrection of Christ is to believe in the person of Christ, that is, that he is the Savior and also that he is God. It is clearly stated so in several places, but in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 through 14, notice the wording. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So notice in that passage of scripture that the Savior was God, is God. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's what it tells us. And if you turn to the New Testament, in John chapter 1, in verse, verses 1 through 3, and then again in verse 14, notice what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then down in verse 14 it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, to believe in the person of Christ, not only to believe that he's the Savior, but that he is God, the creator. Everything was made by him, the Bible tells us. Everything was made for him. Therefore, we can conclude that God the Creator and that the Creator is Jesus Christ, therefore Christ is God. Therefore, look at it this way. This is not a perspective, this is a truth. That the Creator of man is indeed the Savior of man. That's why the Gospel is the crowning work of God's mercy towards mankind. And then to believe in the gospel is to believe in the resurrection of Christ. It is to believe in the promises of God. The promises concerning salvation. Hebrews 7.25 says this, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, unto God, by him. You see, God has the power to save anyone no matter what sin they have committed, no matter how many sins they have committed, and no matter the type of sins they've committed. Now, brethren, you and I can, are pretty disgusted with some of the things that man can do to man. There are things that we've probably never even heard about, of the cruelty of man towards one another. Some of it would make our stomachs turn. But we can't forget this fundamental truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that God is able to save to the uttermost. We can tell story after story after story of those who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, who have committed such awful sins, let alone those of us who have not committed those things. But there have been many, those who have gone on to uh, be uh, punished by death. Those who knew there was no hope for them forever coming out of jail or out of prison. Still made a change and put their trust in Christ. Not because they're trying to save face. Not because they're trying to help the, uh, tell the parole board. Not that they're trying to seek forgiveness from a family. 
but because they know that God is able to save them to the uttermost. The power that raised Christ can save a man to the uttermost. There is not a sin committed where God is unable to forgive. Notice the wording in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10 where it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, here it is, once for all. Christ only had to die once because his sacrifice pays every sin. The Bible goes on to tell us that he'll never go to the cross again. There's no reason for him to go to the cross again. He died once for all. Not only is God able to save a man from his sins, and when I say man, I mean it generically, but he's able to keep him forever. John 10, 28, Jesus said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall ne never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. Then he goes on to say, I and my Father are one. That means Christ has got you in his hand, and he says you'll never perish. And he said, neither will any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. You could, as illustrate, you could just cup your hands like that. That is how secure. And the power of the resurrection proves that God has power to save souls, and he has power to save them to the uttermost, and he has power to keep them. And it's all because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross at Calvary. His resurrection is his assurance of his promises. To believe in the resurrection of Christ is also to believe in the promises of God. Concerning salvation and the promise concerning eternal life. In John chapter 11 and verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, here it is, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's a promise of God. And those promises aren't believed just because it's written, although that's the first place to start. But those promises are believed based on the credibility of the fulfilled promises of God to date. As a matter of fact, this pestilence that we're enduring, this virus that has swept the world, that is killing uh, tens of thousands of people and infecting uh, hundreds of thousands of people, that God had prophesied, God had told us that the closer it comes to the, to the return of Jesus Christ, which I've read, which I read earlier in our text, the closer it comes to his return, the more we're going to see of these very things and the closer it's going to be together. He said we would see of wars and rumors of wars and nation rising against nation and we would see famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And he said this would be the beginning of birth pangs, meaning that as time moved forward, more and more would these things occur closer together, just like a woman who's in labor and more intense. We have seen a virus now Globally, we've seen global wars as well. Earthquakes, all the time there are earthquakes. And so we know by the credibility of God's word, that's just one example, we know that God's promises are absolutely sure. Therefore, we can have confidence when he promises eternal life that he indeed is going to give it. He is also able to give eternal life just as he's able to forgive sins. Christ promised eternal life to those who put their trust in him. John 3, 16, once again, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the promise of God. And he's able to save to the uttermost. And he's the only one. There is no other way to heaven. For the Bible tells us there is no other name named among men whereby one must call upon to be saved. So let me encourage you to think about the things that were preached to you and spoken to you. 
the passages that were put up on the screen. Go back and watch this again and, and ask yourself this question. What will happen to me when I die? And know for sure that God will forgive your sins if you'll just believe in what Christ did for you on the cross at Calvary, his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, God bless you, and I hope this has been a blessing to you. We'll see you next time.